So here we go. Yesterday we were on number 15, which is a three star study goal. There's five types of mining that you need to know about. And then there are three types of ore processing that we're going to get into. Yesterday in class, we talked about placer or placer mining. We talked about underground mining, which is very dangerous and not very common anymore. And the last thing we discussed was open pit mining. Looks like this, where you make a big old hole in the ground. Probably the most cost-effective method of getting valuable metals and stuff out of the ground. I think I mentioned uh, extreme water pollution is in the big old funnel that you can't exactly throw a tarp over when it rains. You might remember I showed you a bunch of pictures. Did we get to this one? Remember, it's like a big old funnel. It's very difficult to contain all that water. And you should all know by now the acid mine drainage formula. No oxygen underground, exposed to the air, oxidation, makes oxide, which makes the water, make acids. So whatever ingredients are in the rock, because it was buried and now it's on the surface and watered, it's going to be acids in that water. That is actually the end of open pit mining. We did finish that yesterday. Next is strip mining. Before you draw, look, all you need to know, all you need to know, don't waste your time, all you need to know, when you make the open pit, imagine you move the drill bit sideways, that's a strip mine. The difference between like an auger and a router if you know woodworking tools. You can write all that down if you want. But all it is is an open pit mine that travels horizontally. Because instead of targeting a pocket, you're targeting like a shelf. This is especially common for coal. Can anybody guess why that would be the case for coal? And why would coal occur in that shape in particular? Because it's dressed down in sediment. That's right. That's right. It's a sedimentary layer. So coal occurs in shelf naturally. So when you mine it, you've got to expose that whole shelf straight mine. I only have one picture because it's everything that you already heard about the big holes in the ground yesterday, except you can see there that line moves sideways. The mine is progressing in that direction. To your right. Yeah, open pit is like a target. Uh, no, it's to stop right before they hit all the good stuff. Um, open pits are basically targeting a deposit that is three-dimensionally identified. We're using it like a law, but sort of thing. you can open pit line down a vertical vein. So the the hole is like this, tracing a vein that's up and down. So you can imagine you're just going to go down the middle or get crash on the side. Um, but yeah, open pit is like usually very distinct. Whereas these are kind of like regional. Like there's this layer down there. We're going to get all the parts of that layer that we can. They usually backfill too. So the way that termites make their tunnels, you know, they pool what they've already been through. When you do the strip line, you just kind of start covering up the hole that you Yeah? What does it take to take that? I mean, there's no like single recipe for a single mine. 
Um, there's mines that operate for just like a year, you know, they just like make a very specific hole and get stuff and close it up. And not take it to but like that one that you saw in Utah, that's like an 18 or 20 year old mine. It's like a, you know, multi, like a zillions of tons a year mine. It's still going for a long time. Any questions? Yeah. Um, and actually, if you want to wait, I'll have something for you to take back to the business office and do a little while. Did you get those papers from the business office? I mean, did you get those papers from the business office? Yeah. If you want to wait, I can give you these to take back. It smells so foul. I might be your upper lip, actually. That's a lip. Like a green <laughs> <laughs> All right, but probably the worst type of mining is this one. Mountain top removal, MTR. You should know that a lot of people describe this by its acronym, MTR. Is that the right word, acronym? <laughs> I'm not real good at that. This is almost certainly the biggest manipulation of the landscape that humans ever knew. Pearson and I were talking about how is coal made? Sedimentation. Sedimentation. So imagine this. You get your layer of coal formed in between many layers of sediment. So you know, if you need help turning it off, I can help you really do with that. I have like Super shortcut for turning off iPhones is like super decisive. It's called the mallet method. You ready to demonstrate? Okay. And then that tectonic uplift and whatnot, you got some weathering. And imagine we make that into mountains where you can see the exposed layer of coal. And you know, back in the day, <clears throat> in many parts of Appalachia, West Virginia, whatever, people would just tunnel into that and take out the coal, underground mining. <clears throat> and then, third and 19, like 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, picked up steam. We started to strip mine these deposits. But starting in the 1990s, 2000, we found an even better method called mountain top removal. Here's how it works. You anchor a cable to the summit, and then use a tractor to drive that cable around the mountain to remove all the vegetation. Stripping of the vegetation is very important because what happens next? Once you've removed all the vegetation, either by hand or by cables or whatever, add dynamite. And then you go, Pop, 
and you've crumbled up the entire mountain top, and then you just push it over, no big deal, like that. Blow up that, push it over here. Blow up that, push it over here. What you're left with is the most convenient type of energy the world has ever seen. We have never had more readily available energy supply than this. Remember I told you the United States uses something like two train cars of coal per second per power plant or some number like that? I can't remember right now. You remember that statistic we're talking about coal? And think about it like what's happening globally that we can, or nationally, that we can provide that much coal? This. We've built these parking lots with gigantic, like regional, just exposed piles of coal. Think about all the cost of trying to like tunnel through mountains to get all this, or trying to like move stuff and like get in piles and drive it around. This is just much more efficient. Couple of workers, couple of minutes, couple of zillion tons of coal. The teams that do this are shockingly small. You get like a mountain range the size of the Riviera, and it'll literally be like a team of 12 bros over a couple of years and it's all gone. That's pretty stunning. It's very difficult to find photographs. I have a few photos, but they're always kind of fuzzy because they're photographed from the air. Because usually these are in kind of remote places and stuff to get back there. And there's like high security because nobody wants to spread these images around. But there's your exposed lump of coal. And you can see all that dirt around it. That's all what used to be the mountain on top of the coal. I don't know if y'all are very good at geography. I know that many of you don't spend a lot of time in the mountains. But there's a very basic concept of the map that everybody needs to know. Watch me. If this was a mountain top, and this was a mountain top, and this was a mountain top, so far so good. Students, what used to be down here? What? And what runs through valleys? Water, rivers. I gotta be really careful how I say this because I'm being videotaped. A lot of my liberal friends like to make fun of George W. Bush to suggest that he was not an intelligent man. I don't really agree. I take no pleasure in calling someone stupid. Also, I know from experience that when you talk for a living, you'll occasionally get videotapes saying dumb stuff. That's the truth. But I think that when we call George W. Bush stupid, we misunderestimate him. If you didn't notice, I just used that term, correct? But there is one thing we can say for sure. George W. Bush was the worst president for environmental policy. He reinterpreted the Clean Water Act to say the feds have no jurisdiction because we need to be able to map the river to show where our jurisdiction is defined by the river. And in this case, where you can no longer find or map a river, the federal government has no jurisdiction, so we don't have to regulate this activity. And mountaintop removal guys were like, did y'all hear that? And during the presidency of George W. Bush, we started, I don't want to say hundreds, but many dozens of mountaintop removal projects across Appalachia. This was one of the big like presidential pendulum issues where George Bush was like, yeehaw, let's look at all that stuff. 
And then as soon as Obama came in, he was like, whoa, 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 whoa. put the brakes on Mount Gump and Google for a minute. And it looks like this type of mining is mostly gone now. I mean, we're not approving new projects now. And frankly, I think that's kind of cool. Because I know that we like coal and we like cheap electricity, but I'm not really sure that I'm willing to do this to get like cheap electricity. Like I could pay a little more for electricity, I think. I don't know if anybody else is impressed by these photographs. But to me, these are like really compelling. Like I feel really bad about like the river that used to be down there and so. stuff. I don't really like rivers. I like crazy about rivers. Have I told you that already? Crazy about rivers. Did I tell you all that I swim in a natural body of water every day of summer? It's okay. You should try it sometime. It's a good summer. If these projects get moving. So they keep cruising, you know, they feel like keep eating up the mountains. They keep, you know, those those shelves, like we were saying, up here, that sediment layer can go on like Really, really far. So you just like blow up this one, blow up this one, blow up this one, you keep going down the range. Uh, one scary problem, of course, is that it's still going to rain. And now that you don't have rivers to buy a remedy water, but you've got a big pile of sediment and all this funky runoff because a lot of that stuff. Remember the acid mine drainage issue with the exposed the oxidation of the water and the acid? So you've got to impound a lot of water, and those things are super dangerous because you all realize it's downhill of that. Again, right? You'll see it. Impoundment reservoir, impoundment dam, water treatment, city, 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 city. Or I guess town, 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 town. So every now and then these, these uh, reservoirs flow, and uh, a few small communities in Appalachia have been lost to flooding from the town. Okay, anybody want to talk more about mining methods? That was the fifth one. Cool. I'd like to pass you something to me. Don't pass it back yet. I passed out little bits of rock with teeny amounts of copper. What you're looking at, please look up, is copper ore. And the question is, how do we process the ore to get the copper out? If you want to pass those back now, the copper is the green and blue stuff in those rocks. There are three types of ore processing that I'd like to tell you about. It's pretty easy. Then we move on from the study board. If you want to copy this down, you could really quick. Please look up. To process ore, you can smelt, heat leach extract, or mercury amalgam. Once they get to the back, you can pass it forward again if you want. Wait, what study board is This is still number 15. That's the end of 15. Five times mining and three times processing board. It's kind of pretty, right? So, like glittery blue green stuff. Am I the only guy that's ever pretty? Fine. I think it's pretty so big. Is the Statue of Liberty clad in copper? Which is why she looks kind of greenish. Because yeah. copper oxidizes. So the, the Statue of Liberty is that color, the green color on your, uh, on your ore deposits. Yeah. 
Mercury amalgamation. Amalgamation. As you can see, that's mostly rock, not a lot of copper. You can find very pure ore, but a lot of ore is like that, 5% copper, 95% rock. So how do we get the copper out? Three ways, they all have environmental problems. You gotta know what these are, and then we're moving on from the goal. Smelting is like it sounds, please look up. You cook the rocks which is also a way to say smoking crack cocaine. You cook the rocks, it melts the metal, and what you get out of that is a little blob of melted metal that you can cool down, and a bunch of rocks that cool off, and then you left the rock. Smelting is melting the metal out of the ore. Unfortunately, we usually use coal to make those fires. So these are a, a really significant source of uh, sulfur oxides in mining communities. Um, some of the most, yeah, the most acidic soil in the United States was around a coal smelter, a coal-powered copper smelter in the Appalachian Mountains. Yeah? Is there like a I'm sure, and I'll bet you that in the future, we'll probably do this with natural gas, which at least addresses the SOX thing. Also, you could use scrubbers in your smelter to remove the SOX from the air pollution, from the dust. But a lot of these things, they're old industries and old places where it's already kind of built. There's some exemptions to environmental regulation for supplying the fundamental materials for our economy. So you could do better, but most of the smelting is still pretty old school. If somebody's like starting a brand new copper smelting facility, I wouldn't really worry about the air pollution that much. It's just kind of a leftover of like early industrial age infrastructure. You can also, number two, make a pile and wash it with sulfuric acid or cyanide. Look, that's actually my lab. I've just kind of run out of ore, and I don't want to buy more, so I'm not washing it anymore. But it's called heat leach extraction or acid washing. Like, you know how you can acid wash beans? You probably don't know that. There was this thing in the 80s called acid wash beans. Well, they never made a comeback, did they? No, they didn't. They did? No, we didn't. All right, all right. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, okay. Acid washing rocks. Look, you sprinkle sulfuric acid on your big old pile. And remember how I told you? that acid rain removes metals naturally occurring in rocks, so if they're toxic metals, you get more of them in your runoff. Talk about that in acid rain air pollution stuff. So you can imagine, if I have like really concentrated sulfuric acid in a nice, clean, organized pile of rocks, I can just shower them with my acids, and then the water that comes out, I just filter it for the metal. Downside of this, of course, is you've also used industrial volumes of sulfuric acid or cyanide or other funky stuff that I don't know about. The only photographs I've seen look like the trash processing barn on uh, Cortina. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Uh, so they're usually covered because you don't want to have all that stuff out of the rain. And then they just have like humongous industrial like mega shower heads and so they just like make a big old pile with a hopper they like turn on the acid flow and then they like tumble and push it over and agitate the rocks to get all the metal to pour out in the liquid filter that liquid 
And I'm guessing that usually you recycle the acids. I don't know how much water is in it except to keep the acids in solution. Yeah, acid like washing through. Yeah, you filter out the metal and you probably reuse the acid. The, the nasty part, of course, is you're playing with industrial volumes of nasty stuff. So the devil's in the details, how many leaks, how do you process all that stuff when you're done, when it's no longer effective. When you put the rocks back in the ground, how much acid is left in the rocks. And number three, there's a few things I need you to put in your notes. Mercury amalgamation is generally illegal and it's associated with those illegal gold mines. Let's get some words right. Uh, does everybody know that mercury is that stuff which, uh, if it methylates, can be absorbed by life and biomagnified? You don't need to tune that the mercury and stuff. Everybody knows that the mercury we're talking about. How many of your parents have silver fillings? Grandparents, maybe? How many of you have seen silver fillings? Like the metal and gray of silver fillings? Oh, well, I, have I have some, because I'm old, and I come from a country where they still use that. This is all to illustrate the other vocabulary term, amalgamation. Anybody know what those silver buildings are made of? Mercury and silver. Mercury and silver, that's right. You get a little jar. Put in some silver dust and a glob of mercury, and then you shake it. When I would go to the dentist, when they were going to fill your cavity, they would turn on this thing that would shake the jar, and it would go, oh, like shake that jar really, really hard, so that it mixes the mercury and the silver filings, the little silver shavings, to make like a paste. It's like Play Doh. And then they had this little scoop, which is like a miniature version of an ice cream scoop. And they would go over the filling, and then they would push it in. And they would get this special thing, and they would push down on your tooth to fill that hole in your tooth with mercury amalgam. Mercury and silver. And then they would scrape away the top, throw it away, or put it back in the jar or something, and then you go home. I still have a silver filling. Can you see how yeah. Um, I don't know how many I've got, but I used to have them in all my teeth. You don't know that I've had like eight weeks now. I have really bad animal. Also, didn't take care of it. I don't know if it's genetics or my habit. I tell you that story about the amalgamation of mercury and silver. Yeah. 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 Another story, how many of you know the secret spot in the foothills in the back country to go get gigantic rainbow trout? That's super fun fishing, but you can't eat it. How many of you have been to a place called Red Rock where you can jump off a really tall rock into a very, very small pocket of water? How many of you have seen somebody miss that jump and get crippled? I think the time, right? It was really scary. Yeah, that's one of the most nauseating things I've ever seen. Yeah, the guy I saw didn't die, but he was paralyzed. It was horrific. I left. I left. I did not laugh. Oh, it was a No, I got out of there so fast. There was a lot of people there. I mean, they didn't handle anything, but they were, I couldn't have any assistance. So how many of you have walked up the river from Red Rock? It's sent in as the river. How many of you have walked up the hill? How many of you have seen signs that say these fish not safe for consumption catch when you're sold? Keep going up to Santa Inez. You get to the two backcountry reservoirs. 
Do you know the big caliente and little caliente hot springs on the back side of East Camino How many of you know that you can go up to Gibraltar and you can East Camino Ciela and go up to the dirt and go up downhill and there's two. From those springs, you're at the top of the Santa Inez River. And if you go down, there's the Mucal Reservoir, and I think it's called the Gibraltar or Montecito Reservoir or something. Those two reservoirs are all fenced off, but there's like gigantic rainbow trout in those reservoirs. You're not allowed to fish until you have to jump the fence and that's the people. And in that little section of river, if you find big pools, there's like gigantic rainbow trout. But there's signs everywhere that say, don't eat these trout. Because back in the day, there used to be a gold mine up there. Back in the day, the only way to get the gold out of the rocks was to amalgamate it to mercury. Here's the process. You take a big bucket of mercury, pour in your gold ore, you heat it up so the gold and the mercury amalgamate, they rub together and become like a jelly of flexible metal. That's really heavy, right? You all realize that mercury is very heavy and gold is very heavy? Are you people aware of that fact? So the mercury and the gold settle to the bottom. They're liquid, so the rocks will float on top of the mercury. Then you just grab all the rocks and throw them overboard until you're looking at the surface of the mercury and gold. And then you got to use some chemical tricks to get the gold and the mercury to separate from each other. Usually some nitric acid, but I'm not an expert. Once they separate, you take all your gold and you go sell it, and now you're left with some liquid mercury nitric acid mess that is kind of spent, it's used up, so you got to pour it in the river. Now comes the details. First of all, you should know that's illegal. Second of all, you should know that's associated with gold mining. Back in the day, that's how we did all the gold mining. So like gold rush period, uh, Santa Barbara colonizing uh, Westerners period. That was all mercury nomination. Because you're not going to take a huge smelter and piles of coal into the back country, and you're not going to take like showers and pans and plumbing and strong acids into the back country, but you can take a few barrels of mercury and nitric acid to bring out a few buckets of gold. This is probably the main reason that we worry about illegal gold mining. It's because of the really significant amounts of mercury that are used. In that environment, it's kind of the only logistically reasonable way to get it rolled out. I know that everybody's falling asleep. Anybody want to ask me anything about processing metals? Okay. Anybody want to ask me anything about the remainder of this assignment, 16, 17, or 18? I'd like to give everyone a, a tip. Number 17, your book does fine. It gets one star, and I'm not going to mess with it. Your book has like a list of good ways to improve minds. And if you don't have any other questions, yesterday's assignment 10.3 vocab. Micro layer is the very thin living layer on soil or water. Like in the ocean, the top three quarters of an inch take like almost all the oxygen. Or in soil, all the decomposition happens on top of the inch or so. That's called a micro layer. It's where all the gas exchange and biological activity happens in the top soil and water. What else? By the way, I should have warned you, I'm expecting the phone call that would interrupt my class. That's rude, but I have to take it if it happens. It's not party time. Anybody else on vocab? Yeah. The thin living layer on top of soil and water. Biological activities. Other vocab? Okay, today's warm up, probably easy. How many of you have heard of e waste before? And it is. What is it? Electronic waste. Why is that a big deal? 
What is toxic? It has a metal and some of the stuff too. There's a whole bunch of mystery ingredients in electronics. Almost all of the metals are bad for you if they react with other ingredients that enter your food supply. There's very few metals that are actually safe to eat. Anybody with the one exception? Iron. A metal you can eat in straight up shavings? Iron. That's why cast iron skillets are super good for your health. You could literally take a cast iron skillet, grind it into powder, and eat it, and that's good for you. Also, like the video, I watched the video of guys who put like a genie and just took a bite out of it and chewed it. A bite? Yeah, he took a bite of it and chewed it. How rigid is that? It's like, I'll show you a video right now. No. All right. I mean, your YouTube habits are really remarkable. Straight up, like Kelly gave me some stupid thing at GNC, and I sit up till like four in the morning and do like five cups of coffee. So I have nothing to do except for watch the next thing in the YouTube line. But well, I saw some random, random stuff. When I do that on YouTube, it takes me two clicks, and I get some like stupid. No, I would. Is it me? Have they profiled me? I don't know. Maybe they profiled me. Does that happen to anybody else? Or that's just me. Yeah, so I get like a lot of fishing stuff in the feed, and then it's like usually within two or three clicks, it's like girls in between doing stuff. Well, it's also people who upload it. Like if they're looking at that kind of stuff. Yeah. Might be the fishing. The fishing world has a lot of people. Anyway, aside from a couple of metals, a majority of metals are to varying degrees bad for you when they enter your water supply or your food supply. So electronic waste, because it has so many interesting ingredients, 20, 30, 40, 50 metals in a cell phone. You can Google that, how many different types of metals in my iPhone or something. It's a pretty remarkable list. And now that we're getting into all those rare herbs and rare metals and all that stuff, we have to handle that waste separately. I have a little slideshow for you. How many of you have heard of e-waste recycling events? Like at Sears or the one that we did last year here in front of the school? There's a lot of electronics out there, and that number continues to grow. You can see that some countries have more and some countries have less, but computers are getting out pretty far, and cell phones are getting even further. I was kind of shocked. I've been in really remote parts of the world. I've been in a lot of places with no electricity, places with no street lights, places with no doors and windows. I've been in places with no cars, but I've never been to a place with no cell phones. I've been to places that have bad cell phone coverage, yeah. But I've never been to a community that doesn't have cell phones. Backcountry Belize, backcountry Amazon, Brazil, backcountry Argentina, Paraguay, all over Mexico, Indian reservations in the U.S. Fiji. Everybody has cell phones. Japan, something like 1.6 cell phones per person. That's right. People have different cell phones for different parts of the day. In Japan, people take these really, really tiny, itty bitty cell phones. They're like half this size, like that size cell phones to work. And they're just like for talking. But they don't mess up your suit line because they're so tiny that you can't tell you have a cell phone in your pocket. They're beautiful, teeny little itty bitty cell phones like that. And then at night when they go out to party, they take out like big old, you know, like uh, easy texting, multimedia, smartphones. Like I don't know if you've really encountered this, but I would probably don't last very long. I know you all were in diapers a couple of minutes ago. But I've had like, I don't know, cell phones for 20 years now. I had pagers when I was your age. 
actually, I never had an alphanumeric pager. I just had pagers when I was ready. So I've thrown away a ton of electronics, and you got to wonder, where does all that stuff go? When you hear about recycling events, you probably have the wrong image in your brain, and this is an important bit of information. The College Board has asked a couple times. We would want e-waste recycling where people who know what they're doing use fancy tools in a well-lighted, well-ventilated environment to deconstruct and unwrap all those different parts of your old iPhone or whatever. But that's not actually how it works. Most of your e-waste is going overseas. Um, in the first decade of this millennium, the key places were India, Pakistan, and China. After that, it kind of shifted to Bangladesh. The last time I checked, the global epicenter of e-waste was Nigeria. But I'll bet you money that by the time I could tell you the top place was Nigeria, it wasn't the top place anymore. I'll bet you money most of your e-waste is going someplace else now. And by the time we hear about it, it'll probably have moved on again. Well, think about it. I don't know, 500, 300 bucks maybe this is a cheaper iPhone. 300 bucks, I'd say. The material inside this thing, like the actual ingredients, I think it's about hundred dollars, 150, something. I'm just gonna guess. Let's we'll call it 150 just for the same conversation. Of material value, right? But imagine if you had to take this thing apart to take out 150 bucks worth of stuff. Think about how many of those are weird alloys, weird mixes, weird ingredients. There's probably more than 150 parts, right? So they're each worth what? Like less than a buck a piece? What's that labor going to be worth to demanufacture that in a way that gives you a dollar part that you can still recycle? To a resource value after recycling, it's probably less than a dollar. You know what I'm saying? It's not profitable at all. <coughs> there is no really careful demanufacturing. Apple has been fighting the stigma of making environmentally polluting products for 20 years now, and they just announced a fancy smart robot that can demanufacture their iPhones. With that exception, and I'm not very confident that's really friendly, most e-waste recycling is not what you think. It's more like this. You go to an e-waste recycling event in a Sears parking lot, and by the time the stuff leaves in a container, there's nothing e-waste recycling about it. That's just scrap material. In the United States, it's not really worth tearing it apart. Even if you're dirt poor, you can do better. Um, picking up recycling, um, maybe asking for change, uh, maybe finding uh, public services or opportunities to get job training or whatever. Globally, though, that old monitor that doesn't work anymore, if you can pay a buck for it and take out 80 cents of a big magnet and then sell the remainder for 60 cents, you just pay 40 cents. So you go to your home and you say, hey, I got this TV, it doesn't have the magnet anymore, but give me 40, give me 50 cents for it. She's like, great. She pulls out all the wires and melts them to get copper that she can sell to the local copper pipe manufacturer guy. And then now she sells the remainder of the TV to 50 cents to homegirl, who pulls off all the plastic and takes it to the plastic scrap place and they give her 30 cents for the plastic scrap, and she sells the TV to her for 30 cents and she made a dime. And so you just downvalue the scrap. Step by step by step, you can take out the motherboards and melt them for solder. You can find gold inside parts that I don't understand. Little bits of gold in many electronics. I don't get how this works, but children get trained to do this. You know, you harvest the little resistors, and if you melt them, there's lead. I don't know what's in them. This is all over my head.
But if you're talking about an economy where resources are hard to come by, our trash has some marginal resource value. In parts of the world where people have like zero economic opportunity, this is worth it. All the way down to scrapping it out of the landfill, there's something you can still glean from this. This is actually e-waste recycling almost everywhere in the world. From the year 2000 until 2010, about 80% of America's e-waste went to those three countries. And those countries were embarrassed by public reporting that showed families living very closely connected to e-waste salvaging. Often using their own pots and pans to like melt the wired scrap copper or whatever. We don't consider that stuff safe enough to put in our landfills. So technically it's illegal to ship this stuff internationally even though people need the economic opportunity to let them follow their environment with it. But this is really tough to regulate. Really, really tough to regulate. Most e-waste recycling goes into these places. There's like a little trend now to find better trained individuals with like slightly better protections, but usually this isn't for a profit. It's just the cost of waste disposal. In many parts of the world, if you're gonna make a television, you have to pay for the system that takes apart your electronics. But not in the US. Once you've bought it, you're just stuck. Like, there's no way to get rid of this thing without causing harm. Okay. I don't know about you, I feel really bad thinking about this. I feel like really, really bad about myself. I scrap electronics all the time. Alexa, you want to stop the